Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's Pastor Telly here, just wishing you a happy Sabbath and a welcome to the Cambrian Park Los Gatos live stream worship service today here on May 9th. Uh, I want to start off by saying happy Mother's Day weekend to all the beautiful women in this world. My beautiful wife, Bianca, happy Mother's Day to my beloved mother, Blanca Tello. They share the same name, but just different ethnicity, Blanca and Bianca. Mami, te quiero mucho. Feliz día de madres y la quiero con todo mi corazón. And so folks, happy Sabbath to you all. We have a beautiful service for you today. We're going to start off by going back in time and and uh, listening to the music from our SoCal camp meeting. It is an amazing time of the year that unfortunately this year got canceled because of the COVID pandemic. But next year, make sure you plan to be there. Bring your family. People from all over the world come to gather for a 10-day retreat of praise, of Bible study, of fellowship, of activities. You just name it, all kind of workshops. It is an amazing time, an amazing experience with the family of God internationally. So please join us next year for SoCal Camp Meeting. But enjoy the music that we're going to be having together uh, today, reminisce about that. We're also going to have a message from our president, our conference president, Ramiro Cano. Uh, that will be a blessing to you to give you an, uh, an eye, a bird's eye view of what Central California Conference is doing to manage and, and mitigate this COVID uh, pandemic for the impact of the gospel of Jesus Christ here in our territory. Get the kids together because we also have a very popular guest at Cambrian Park. Ultra Gore is going to be with us today. A beautiful message from him. So make sure you get the kids together. He's going to be uh, showing us some love today. Uh, we have a beautiful video for our mothers. Tribute to them. And just before the sermon, we're going to have a blessing from an incredible vocalist named Sarai, Sarai Rivera, who sings like an angel. I know you'll be blessed. You may not understand because she's singing in Spanish, but hold on. At the end, there is a special blessing for all of us who are awaiting the anticipation of getting to heaven and speaking the angelic language, Espanol. We love you. Happy Sabbath. And I'm so glad you're here to worship with us today. May God bless you. Have a beautiful day. So Happy Sabbath. Our first song is going to be Give Me the Bible. Oh 
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. You brought us through another week. We're thankful that we're coming to your holy and Sabbath hours, Lord. We pray that we pray for your Holy Spirit to pour out in this camp, Lord. That our experience here may be a bright and a good one, Lord. Watch over us, Lord, as we continue our time here. In the name of Jesus, we all pray. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. like-minded people right and that they can help you through these times and I'm just so thankful that my friends and my family can actually point me to Jesus and Jesus is found in the Word of God and I'm so thankful for this time our next song we're gonna be singing tonight is thy word
Dear Central California Conference Church family, the last couple of months have been very trying and very challenging as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is true within the global, national, and local communities, not to mention to you personally and that of your loved ones. Every facet of society has been turned upside down. We have had to adjust the way we do church and school, as well as the administrative functions of the conference. We are learning new platforms of delivery, requiring sharpening and acquiring new methods. Our conference theme during this crisis has been, the church is not closed, just the buildings. Interestingly enough, with several of our churches, the digital platforms now being utilized is actually increasing the attendance and viewership to our virtual church. We recognize that for some, digital platforms are a foreign and intimidating undertaking. As a result, the conference has stepped up its resources by providing weekly virtual technical training sessions for our pastors being facilitated by our ministerial evangelism department. Our treasury department continues to stay connected with local church treasurers, providing training and being available to answer questions. We appreciate very much the work of our teachers, continuing to provide distance learning to our students. We do recognize that for this delivery to be successful, parents have had to engage with their children to augment the class work. Of course, this can be challenging to our parents as they too are having to work from home, not to mention our teachers, certainly making for very, very busy days. We appreciate the effort of our pastors continuing to provide spiritual food and staying connected with their church family via alternative digital and social media avenues. The Central California Conference website has also been updated to include all of the available church worship digital links in our territory, as well as providing six different ways to donate during this church season. The conference office is closed. However, through staggered staff schedules and remote online processes, the wheels of the conference continue to turn. We appreciate the flexibility of our staff who have quickly shifted to a new normal. Bills are still being paid, payroll continues to cut paychecks to conference employees, etc. The ABC store has continued operating as before, and the planned ABC truck routes and schedules are still being planned. Of course, guidelines of social distancing and protection will be adhered to. We did have to cancel all of our annual events such as camp meeting, Camp Wawona summer camp, Teen Bible Academy, Pathfinder programs, Life Hope Center clinics, mission trips, and many other school and church evangelistic programs. However, a good number of churches are joining virtual evangelistic campaigns, such as the one facilitated by It Is Written entitled, Hope Awakens. Our Young Adult and Youth Discipleship Department has developed programs to engage with the young adults. I understand that they facilitate 15 different weekly digital programs. The tithe and local church giving has certainly been affected. The March tithe was down by 10.66%, which translated to $682,000 less than last year. April and May are sure to be heavily impacted as well. We want to express our appreciation and the faithfulness and commitment of God's people here in Central. We continue to pray for those whose jobs have been affected by this pandemic. Many industries are shut down, there's mass unemployment, and many of our church members have been placed on furlough or laid off. As a result of the economic impact, the conference administration has developed a financial plan composed of five phases. These phases will be implemented as the effects of this pandemic unfold. We want to make sure that we are exercising wise and sound stewardship principles of God's sacred resources. Unfortunately, we too may have to enact reduction in force because of the budgets having to be adjusted. We are calling for Sabbath, May 9th as a day of fasting and prayer. Now more than ever, we need the hand of God to be over His church. We need the power of heaven to lead and guide His church through these troubled waters. We praise God for His assurance and for His promises. I could never have foreseen the state the world is in and how every segment of society has been touched and affected by this crisis. These are certainly unprecedented times we are living in. The state of affairs did not catch the Lord by surprise. 
He did not cause the virus, but He did permit this to appear in the midst of our journey. I believe there is a reason. There is a purpose for you and for me. What purpose would that be? Inspiration shares the following. Satan is working in the atmosphere. He is poisoning the atmosphere. And here we are dependent upon God for our lives, our present and eternal lives. And being in the position that we are, we need to be wide awake, wholly devoted, wholly converted, wholly consecrated to God. But we seem to sit as though we were paralyzed. God of heaven, wake us up. Selected Messages. Volume 2, page 52. Famines will increase, she adds. Pestilences will sweep away thousands. Dangers are all around us from the powers without and satanic workings within. But the restraining power of God is now being exercised. Here's the purpose. God has a purpose in permitting these calamities to occur. They are one of His means of calling men and women to their senses. By unusual workings in nature, God will express to doubting human agencies that which He clearly reveals in His Word. That's the events, page 28. His purpose then is to call us to attention to the closing scenes mentioned in Scripture, to give us a sense of urgency, to set in order those things that are lacking in our own personal lives, as well as that of the church. You see, the Lord wants us all to be saved and none to be lost. Scripture adds the following in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The Lord wants to draw aside the curtain of the closing scenes of earth's history. The Lord wants our attention. He wants us to be engaged with a united front, as it says in Luke chapter 19, verse 13, Occupy until I come. Therefore, take courage that you and I are loved with an everlasting love. There's much talk these days about reopening the economy, and I'm sure we all want things to go back to normalcy. However, I don't think life will be the same as before. We are now in a new environment, a new normal. And as a church, God's church needs to continue to shift, to adjust, be adaptable and efficient within the context and backdrop of a new environment. We are given this counsel. Let every worker in the master's vineyard study, plan, devise methods to reach the people where they are. We must do something out of the common course of things. We must arrest the attention. We must be deadly in earnest. We are on the verge of times of trouble and perplexities that are scarcely dreamed of. Evangelism, page 122. Dear Central Church family, God will see us through. This too shall pass. And in the meantime, let's unitedly work with our hands together and not let up. Let's plan. Let's use every means through the power of the Holy Spirit. Every soul needs to be touched by the salvific message of this Lord that we love. May the Lord be upon you and His church is my prayer. God bless you. Today's sermon from Pastor Tello is about unity. As we are all in the middle of this terrible pandemic, it seems like unity is something we have little of, with social distancing and shelter in place. Though the Lord knows His children need unity and togetherness. Romans 14, 7 says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. But unity as a whole has much more meaning than just being together. And that's why today's sermon from our pastor is important for all of us to hear. Until next time, this is Ultra Gore, and I send healing gorilla hugs to you all. For the moms who raised us up gave us hope, and made us strong. For the young moms, who became moms sooner than expected and gave it all they had. For the single moms, who had to figure out how to do this on their own. For those who never got called mom, but who cared for us all like a mom would. For the hurting moms, who've loved and lost, but never given up. 
for the praying moms who don't always know what to do, but always know who to talk to. For the working moms, the stay home moms, the cooking moms, and the takeout moms. For taking care of us when you barely had enough time to take care of yourself. For teaching us how to walk and how to make a difference. For the late night snuggles and the early morning pancakes. For sitting with us after our first breakup. For lifting us up when others put us down. For the rides, the meals, the laundry, and the birthday parties. For the years, tears, laughter, and love. It's not enough, but we want to say thank you. Thank you for doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. We love you. We honor you. We remember you. We thank you.
I told you, I told you that Sister Sarai can sing. Man, I have, I just play her music all day long. I love the talent that God has given that young lady. And so happy Sabbath again, everyone. Um, and again, to all our beautiful, loving, caring, self-sacrificing, amazing ladies happy mother's day weekend uh to all of you uh we wish uh, we could be doing our traditional um mother's day lunch and all the men uh taking care of you on this sabbath day but you're gonna have to wait till next year or get on your husband's or son's cases so they do it all year long for you anyways anyways i love you guys uh, and again, thank you for joining us here this Sabbath as we begin um, to study God's word together. Now, today's message is, you know, it, it's kind of like a Mother's Day message in the sense that we're going to be looking at uh, Matthew seven verse Matthew chapter seven verses seven through eleven, a very important verse of scripture verses of scripture. That, that Jesus re-emphasized. Now, he hits on this several times, but he wants, he's really wanting us to understand a few things. He's to really grasp who God is and how he wants us to relate to God because the, the, the way the people related to God in Jesus' day was backwards. It was not the way uh, God wanted us to understand how much he loves us and how that relationship uh, should be. And so we're going to continue hitting that again in a different angle. And I hope that you're blessed um, today. So have your grab your Bibles and open them with me to the book of Matthew uh, chapter 
7 and verses 7 through 11. Now, we're going to be having all the verses on the screen again, most of them. But I put all the verses there below here so you have them. And you get used to turning the pages of your own Bible. I know it's it's convenient to have the, the, the messages on the screen for you to share. And I do that for a number of reasons. Number one, I don't know where you're watching this, this stream from. Whether you're at home or you're on a bus or you're on a train or you're at work and you just can't have your physical bible there with you but you can have the verses there for you and then when you get home you can look up all the verses for yourself and continue to to love and grow in the study of god's word so let's jump right in and let's have a word of prayer and we will start reading in matthew chapter 7 and verse 7 let's pray father thank you again so much for this beautiful sabbath for this chance to be here uh, with everyone who is watching us uh, via this stream. We love you, Father. We thank you. And today we ask for your Holy Spirit to be with us, uh, to give us a, a more beautiful, profound understanding of your word for our lives. We thank you, dear God, and we pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. All right, folks, so let's jump right in. Let's turn to our Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. And in Matthew 7, we're going to be reading together this incredible passage that jesus said he says ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives he who seeks finds and to him who knocks the door will be opened then he says which of you if his son asks for bread will give him a stone or asks for a fish, will give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Now, that's an incredibly beautiful verse, and a verse that we've read over and over and over again, but it's still something so foreign to our way of thinking. Now, as we read this, we're going to be looking at how God or Jesus again reiterates the importance of looking at God the Father, not as some divine deity up there somewhere, but as our loving Father who knows us and loves us dearly. So uh, let's let's look at a few comments and a few not comments few Bible verses to help us understand this and how this, this concept was so new even in Jesus' day, even though Jesus was walking among them, even though they had been studying the scriptures for thousands of years, this concept of God being a loving father was just not, it was not fluid, it wasn't natural for them. So turn your Bibles with me to the book of First Peter uh, chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, where it says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him. Look what it says there. Because he cares for you. Now, I love that. I love that so much because the Bible clearly says the reason we can cast our anxieties onto God, the reason we know that God will lift us up with his mighty hand is because he cares for us. You know, there's that there's that saying that, you know, it's a thought that counts. And we kind of throw that out there, but the reality is the idea of knowing that someone cares is incredibly life impacting. And God wants us to know without a doubt that God cares for us. For example, let's go on here. John 16, Jesus again is making a, another uh, statement to his disciples, wanting them to understand what he's wanting them to grasp and, and apply to the lives. And he says, listen, a time is coming and has come when you will be scattered each to his own home. All of you will run to preserve his own life. Obviously, they ran when Jesus um, was captured. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my father is with me. Then he says in verse 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. 
he says, I have overcome the world. Now, Jesus is understanding, listen, he's understanding our two things there. He understands our human natural reaction that when we're scared that we run to a place we feel safe. And truly, when Jesus was captured, the disciples all fled and left him. And he was there physically alone. But he says, listen, I was not alone because the Father was with me. Okay. And then he says, listen, I've told you these things because in the world you will have much trouble. You will have trouble. But take heart because I have overcome the world. See, it was the knowledge of the Father being with Jesus that got him through the most devastating experience of his existence, not only here on earth, but his existence even before time in heaven. The fact that he would be separated from his from his divinity, separated from God, the Father on the cross for our sins. It was the knowledge of knowing that the Father was with him that helped him through that trial. And it was that assurance that he was able to overcome the world. It was that, that knowledge that helped him overcome that. And that's what helps you and I. Because we're going to go through some crazy, difficult times in our life if you're not going through them already. And it is only the knowledge of knowing that God is with us and for us that gets us through those very difficult times. So with that in mind, let's go back to the passage in Matthew chapter 7. And I want you to read these verses again because there are three things here. Jesus gives three action verbs. Now, action is something that is being done. And look what he says. He says, ask. ask. That's number one. And he will be given. Seek. You will find. Knock and the door will be opened onto you. He gives these, these, these present imperatives as almost as a command. In other words, if you want a closer, a stronger, a more profound walk with me. If you want our relationship to grow, you have to do something about that. You have to ask, you have to seek, and you have to knock. There's something that you and I must do, which makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, what relationship do you have, whether it's with your with your spouse or your child or a good friend or or anyone, what relationship do you have that is actually a good relationship that doesn't involve both people in that relationship pursuing each other? And the Bible is incredibly clear how God pursues our hearts, that God is always intimately involved with every aspect of our lives, but yet he's also wanting us to do our part in this relationship with him. So, he says, ask, seek, knock, okay? Um, let me ask you this. What is Christ saying? What Christ is saying is that if, if you seek him, if you knock, the door will be opened. He will respond. He's not going to ignore you. I mean, in verse 8, he says that very clearly. He says, everyone who asks receives. Now, remember... Um, Christ had already spoken two times about praying in the Sermon of the Mount. Once he gave the Lord's Supper, and then he, he, he presents a God who is, who is caring and loving towards us. You know, let me turn this off here. Okay. You know, we got to keep in mind that this concept, again, to the Jewish audience who he was speaking to, was a new thing. They, they just were not totally clear on this idea that God... Is so loving that God is so personal that they can approach God as anyone approaches a father here. Okay, uh, and that was so mystifying for them. For example, let's go to John 17, and Jesus again is saying, I've brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now he's praying to his father, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Now, I want you to look at verse 7 again because something more needs to be said about that. We need to look at these imperatives. There's, there's three imperatives there. Ask, seek, and knock. 
but we can't take these out of context. And I, I know a lot of people personally, and I myself is, have done this too. You know, I have asked God, I've prayed for God, and He hasn't responded, and I, that that makes us frustrated. I mean, have you ever watched? Have you ever? <laughs> it's funny. Have you ever watched a little child? Now I got their mother and father, and the mother and father maybe is in a conversation. They're already talking to somebody, and, and the child doesn't think that the parent hears them, but the parent does hear them, and the, the child throws a fit. We do that same thing with God. We 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 assume that God doesn't hear our prayers. We assume that you know we've been knocking, we've been looking, and we can't find Him anywhere. But we have to make sure that we don't take these things out of context God never fails his promises God always a hundred percent of the time keeps his word he never fails us but we can't think that everything we ask of God he will reply the way we want him to. See, Christ is not saying here that everything we ask will be given irrespective whether it's good or bad for us. That's incredibly important to understand. When we look at scripture, I mean, I think, I think for, I would, man, I don't want to make this sound bad, but I would, I would say the vast majority of people that look at religion, that look towards a divine God, a God, a, a higher power, look for a they look for God in the context of him being some kind of lottery ticket a a solution to all of their pain and sorrow not only a solution emotionally and theologically but now like they want the answer now and that makes sense with the world in which we live, that everything is about speed and high-speed internet and all kinds of bells and whistles that you and I are used to. We're used to getting things our way right now, especially Americans. We can go to a restaurant, you can go to anywhere, you can order exactly what you want the way you want it. And we, we bring that mentality into our relationship with God, and that's... Not what God teaches. I mean, that's not even what we do with our own children. So God wants us to understand that he is saying, what he, Jesus is saying is that he's going to give us only that which is good for us. Only that which is good for us. He will never refuse that which is for our benefit. Remember what he previously said in Matthew 6, verse 33. He told us, that if you seek his kingdom first, all and his righteousness, all these things will be given to you as well. So God knows that we have a need. God knows that we that we have real tangible needs, especially right now. I know millions of Americans have lost their jobs and their income. People all over the world by the millions have been impacted by this virus in a v in a very in a very real and tangible way. And to say that God doesn't care about those things would not be true. It would not be accurate because God desperately cares about all of these things for our lives. So he's talking in chapter 7 to his disciples who have, he hopes, have began to put this in practice. To begin, to be, who have begun to understand and, and to pray to the Father in such a way when he, when Christ has already talked about praying, give us today our daily bread, our, our necessities of life. He's always a concerned father. Now, another reason why you and I have such a difficult, difficult time understanding this. And I think this is probably very accurate and relative today for it being Mother's Day weekend is the fact that we have not always had the best example of a loving parent of a loving father, of a loving mother. You see, the reality is many of us who are parents, many of us who, who are raised by broken parents are raising other children as broken parents. And so this, this concept of, of, of a loving father, even though we all long for it, we all know that 
when a parent betrays us or abandons us or doesn't love us the way we naturally should expect to be loved. That, that natural love that we expect that should be there comes from God because he created us that way. He created us in his own image. He created us to be in community. He created us to, to be in that loving relationship with him. And so we wrestle with the idea of a God who is really loving because in a lot of ways, humanly speaking, many of us have never experienced that in our own lives. And so this concept of a loving father is not only new theologically for the Jews and for us today, for the Gentiles, but it's it's a new perspective of life for many people. To have a loving mother or a loving father, the way the Bible describes God to be. Okay, so so first of all, when we pray this request, there, there are presuppositions that we have to acknowledge there. Okay, there's, there's things that we need to understand that when we pray this beautiful prayer, when we, we hold these verses accountable. And we say, God, you said, ask, you said, seek, you said, knock, I'm, I'm asking, I'm seeking, I'm knocking. There, there are things that presuppose God's response. And no, number uh, one of them is, you know, we have to understand that we have to have the knowledge of God's will for us. We have to know without a shadow of a doubt that when we come to God in prayer, we, we hold him accountable to this verse is because, is because friends, that we know that God loves us and that God wants only the best for us. You know, I, I look at, I remember you know, it being Mother's Day, I remember I, mean, I grew up with a single mother. My parents divorced when I was young. And, and those of you who are, who are who are raised or are raising children as a single parent or you were raised by a single parent, you know certain difficulties are very, very real. And the vast majority of those are financial. And I remember so many times my mother would would do so much just to to cover up the the struggle of life so we thought everything was okay i mean i remember i remember i remember one time i, I forgot i think i was at one of my cousin's house or something and and we were having some rice and I said, hey, do you have some peanut butter? And they're like, ew, that's weird. But I, I grew up eating rice with peanut butter because my mother told us that it was good and it was it was a treat. But the real reason why she gave us rice with peanut butter is because we didn't have money for, for meat. And she wanted to make sure that her kids would get enough protein. And somewhere along the line, she someone told her that peanut butter has a lot of protein so she would feed us peanut butter like crazy. Things like that. And I never questioned my mother. I never said, Mom, where's the steak? Mom, why are you cheating me out? Where's, where's the chicken? When my mother said, this is a special treat, I was like, woohoo, rice and peanut butter. I was, I was on cloud nine. Because... My understanding was already there that without a shadow of a doubt that my mother only and always did what was best for me. I'm very blessed and privileged to know that I have a mother like that. And though my parents were divorced at, at a young age, uh, my mother raised me, but my father was very involved in my life as well. So I, I can say that I have in some ways, stronger than others, uh, I had always both my parents in my life in some capacity. That's another story there. But I want to share with you this beautiful verse in James chapter 4. He says, when you ask, you do not receive. Okay? Because you ask with wrong motives. 
that you may spend, he says, on your pleasures. Now, look at this here together. Now, James is not contradicting Jesus here. But he's just making a very honest observation. He says this thing, a lot of you guys don't have what you want because you're only asking for things for your own sinful motives. You want to be you want to be rich so you can live in a gluttonous lifestyle that will destroy you in other ways. And Jesus knows that that's not maybe what's best for you. And so sometimes God says no. Sometimes we pray, God, if I had this, I would serve you better. Or we say things like, God, if you heal me, I will spend my life worshiping and serving you. And that may be a beautiful prayer. And you know, there's a perfect example, Peter, not Peter, but Paul. Now, Paul in this verse, he, in, in context, you know, Paul just before this in verse seven, verse six says, he says, listen, if anyone has a reason to to boast and to celebrate what God has done for them, to show off how powerful God is in their life. It's me, but he doesn't do that. As a matter of fact, he says this. He says, listen, to keep, this is Paul saying after he he understood and came to the conclusion of what and how he could trust God, he said this, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassingly, surpassingly great revelations there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Now notice there, Paul's like, look, look, man, God was blessing me so much to keep me from being conceited. God gave me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Wow. Wow. How many times have we blamed Satan for the struggles of our life when in reality it could be that God is letting that struggle happen to you for your benefit? Now just think about this. Let's just put in context who Paul is. This brother was was raising people from the dead. Can you imagine if you raised someone from the dead? How would that make you feel? Are you kidding me, man? If sometimes, you know, someone helps put a chair away at church at the potluck and they act like they just saved the world. It's crazy. Can you imagine if people had the power to do what Paul did? This brother was bitten by snakes, venomous snakes, and he just he just threw them off like nothing. He was shipwrecked three times. God was this brother's shadow would heal people. And yet He stayed humble. Why did he stay humble? He's explaining to us why. Because God knows and God knows our nature. Sometimes some of us get so big headed with the spiritual gifts that God has given us. Whether it's that, you know, someone sings a beautiful song and, you know, we we, we love to hear all the praise and accolades. And and if someone doesn't say, hey, that was a beautiful song, we say, well, I'm not singing here again. I have met some extremely spiritual, bougie musicians and i have met some incredibly beautiful humble powerful singers as well because naturally we are sinful and when if we're not careful we fall into that trap so paul he goes on to say let's keep reading here he says listen look what he said three times three times i pleaded i pleaded with the lord to take away from to take it away from me now i don't know about you friends Have you ever prayed a prayer over and over and over again, trying to convince God that your perspective, that your way is really the better way? Have you been that guilty? I've done that. And I'm sure we've all been there and done that. Paul says three times, not only did Paul, I love how the Bible puts these words in place. Not only does Paul say, "I I prayed three times, but the Bible says, I pleaded. He pleaded. This is a man who was raised in the dead. His shadow was healing people. Prison bars were, I mean, you name it, this incredible miracles by the hands and the voice of 
Paul. And here he is pleading with God to take a thorn. Spiritual thorn. We don't know if it was a busted hip, a bag, whatever. He has some kind of a medical condition. And the answer came back every single time. No. That's tough. That's heavy, man. Just, I just, just when I say that, I think I literally flashes before my mind. So, so many people that I know that used to walk with Jesus and used to come to church and used to serve in the church, used to be so happy, leave their walk with God because of prayer request was answered with a no. But Paul doesn't stop there. And he says, look what he says. He says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Woo-wee! Love this stuff. Paul got to the place in his life where he said, you know what, man? Jesus, thank you. Thank you for this struggle. Thank you for this pain. Thank you for... This trial, because I know that in my weakness, you are made strong. You see, friends, Satan is very aware of our weaknesses. And Satan uses our weaknesses to destroy us. How many times have we said, oh, man, I blew it again. Oh, God, I, I messed up again. I, I fell in that same temptation. I, I made the same mistake over. And I told you I would never do it again. And then Satan's right there like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You messed up again. You hypocrite. You, you disgrace. You are just a shame. How dare you go to church? How dare you pray to the God of heaven? How dare you? How dare you? How dare you? But the beauty of the gospel is that while Satan uses our weaknesses to destroy us, God uses those same weaknesses to show us how he alone restores us. God allows us, he, he allows us to fall on our face. He allows us to suffer. He allows us to wrestle with these things, friends. So we learn to trust and discover the power that is only found in Jesus. You see, Paul did not have the power to do, do these miracles despite of his struggle. He did not have power to preach and power to heal and power to raise the dead only while he was a hundred percent healthy only while he had food in his belly or money in his his in his in his pocket or a house to live in no matter what his circumstance was no matter what his physical condition was he always kept his eyes on jesus and he always found the power to carry him through and that, my friends, is what Jesus is talking about. To not depend upon our ability, on our own resources. Paul is saying the weaker you are, the more of God's strength you will see. How about that? How many times do we say, I want to be a powerful Christian? We look at people and we say, man, I wish I was as powerful of them as them. But the, true of, the truth of the matter is, is that it's in your weakness, the power of God is revealed so number one when you ask please ask knowing that god will only say yes if it's good for you okay number two we have to pray but we have to pray with faith 
there's in Mark chapter 19, there's a beautiful story there of a father who comes and asks Jesus for a favor. And I want you to notice how Jesus responds. And this favor is pretty amazing because it regards the, the healing of a man's, a man's son. The Bible says in Mark uh, chapter 9, verse 24, the man says, if you can, please. And Jesus says, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Man. And we know what happens. God healed his son that very moment when he showed that he just believed in the Lord. So when we come to God, we have to have faith knowing that he's going to answer. And that answer indeed may be no. It may be yes, it may be no, and it may be wait. But it will be answered. In this context, I want to give you another verse, and very, a very popular verse, very should be a known verse, where it's Hebrews 11.6, and he says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Notice that faith isn't just believing, but faith is knowing that God rewards those who earnestly seek him. So when we do pray... We have to pray with a faith in God's amazing love. Now, another thing that's important here, I want to go to the third point here, is desire. Another presupposition to this beautiful prayer is desire. When we pray, <sighs> how... And what, I should say, is our motive, our desire? What is it, God, that you want me to do? Because our desire needs to be to give God the glory. In other words, it's one thing to say, God, I'm seeking for your guidance in my life because I have a decision to make. Versus saying, God, I'm needing your guidance in my life because I want my decision that I make to bring you the most glory and honor possible. The Christian's life is a life of servitude. It is a life of sacrifice. But not just willy-nilly. It's, it's because we have a purpose. And that purpose is to bring people to the saving grace of Jesus. And so that desire has to be there. It has to be the utmost part of a person's heart when they pray, when they're seeking God's will in their life. See, desire is magnified and realized best in a relationship when it's it goes both ways you know just just in relations in, in general it's it's a beautiful thing to know that someone likes you i mean do you guys remember that old school i mean maybe now they do it like text messages or snapchats or tiktoks you know do you like me yes or no but back in my day it was just a letter do you like me circle yes do you like me circle no oh we do that uh what was that you count the 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 petals on a flower right uh, yes, no, I forgot what it was, but you, you, we used to do things like that to get uh, uh, an idea if someone was interested in us. And we, we went back and forth and it was beautiful to know. It, it's an incredible feeling to know that you are wanted. And when the Bible's talking about being, being thirsty, to have that desire, you know, the Bible talks about in Matthew 5 or 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for they will be filled. God is wanting us to hunger and thirst for his righteousness, to be like Jesus, not just to be able to have a life with no problems, but to be able to have a peace in the midst of our problems. So this has to be the prerequisites to this incredible prayer. So he goes back 
you know, God goes back, you know, Matthew goes back and he goes on to tell us these, these incredibly beautiful verses. And he says, which of you, these beautiful verses, if a son asks for bread, will give him a stone. You see, friends, the, the presumption is there is that a father who loves a child will only want to give the child exactly what is best for them. If he asks for a fish, will he give him a snake? No. The serpent in those days made a poisonous snake. It will do you harm. No parent is going to give their child a poisonous snake. But then he says this, and he says, in verse uh, 11, he says, if you then be an evil. Now, when people say, I, I'm not evil. What he's, 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 he's referencing to our natural nature. Of course, he, he obviously in the verses above, he says, he, he, he knows a father loves a child. But the reality is, is that our sinful nature is there. He's saying, if you who are naturally sinful and selfish, know how to give good things to your children, how much more is God going to give things to those who ask of him? It's a beautiful verse. I love this, this little section of verses there. So in other words, it, so why are you doubting the Heavenly Father is what he's saying. It doesn't make sense that if you, a sinful human being, is able to find kindness and love for a child that your heavenly father will not feel that magnified by a million towards those who come to him, who love him. In Luke chapter 11, this, this promise is also outlined there and it's given there, but in a different context. The same words are used almost word for word, except for good gifts. Okay, in Matthew, he says good things or good gifts depending on the translation you're reading. But in Luke, he gives he replaces good gifts with something else. In Luke, he says, How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So in other words, why did he use the Holy Spirit here instead of good gifts? Because the title that Christ gave to the Holy Spirit is Paracletos. Which means, it means that someone is by your side. Okay? That's very important to understand. Because God wants us to know that we are never alone. Especially in this, this time of COVID-19 and we're all feeling distant from our loved ones and from our friends and our family. And we just miss the routine of life and we miss the physical contact and interactions with our with the people we love and we tend to feel alone i mean there's an actual psychological term or understanding called cabin fever we're just too we're, we're boxed in too long we just can't get used to it god says listen i if you ask if you seek if you knock the holy spirit will be given unto you in other words, you will never be left alone. You will never be lonely again is the promise that Jesus is given to us in these verses as well. It's a beautiful thing to know that we can come together even though we're scattered abroad. Right now, like the disciples were scattered even when Jesus left. But Jesus in the Gethsemane said to them, listen, pray took him, took three of his disciples with him to pray in, in Gethsemane, and they all fell asleep. Three times he found them doing that, snoring in the most difficult trial of Jesus' life up until that day. And then they all fled. But Jesus knew that one person was with him the entire time. Jesus knew that there was one person that would never leave his side. God, the Holy Spirit. See, we can't feel the Holy, we can't see the Holy Spirit, but we can feel it like the wind. I know in my life there have been times, man, that I just felt broken, lost, and alone. I lifted up my voice to God and I opened my word and I said, God, draw near to me. And that peace is real. 
the presence of God is real. And that, my friends, is what's beautiful of knowing that God's Spirit is always by our side. And so today it's my prayer that we learn to practice this, this promise in our time of sheltering in place. As the, the world begins to open up again and we begin to enjoy our fellowship with each other again and, and we long to be able to have worship services again, yes, that's coming. But in the time being, take the time to worship God and His presence in your life. You see, my friends, Jesus is incredibly, incredibly clear with us. He wants us to know this beautiful verse is absolutely something we can take to the bank. Ask, it will be given. Seek, you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. To him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if a son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask of him? You see, my friends, God knows his beautiful promises are real. And God wants you and I to always have that trust in him. I want to give you a story. Uh, I'll tell you a story of how Jesus, or not Jesus, how a, a lady named Florence Littour, I think I'm saying her name right, Littour. Anyway, she's a famous speaker who had spoken at many, many Adventist camp meetings and many Adventist um, fellowship uh, gatherings. And she gave a series of, of uh, to a woman's group in South Carolina. Uh, and this is a statement I want to share with you that she said because one of the ladies at one of these conventions asked her to describe her impressions of Seventh-day Adventists after speaking to many at similar Adventist gatherings. And sometimes, you know, it's good to hear how other people see us. Sometimes it's, get to, it's good to get that, out, that outsider's perspective of our faith, of our lives, of our fellowship. I mean, that's a good, it's a good thing to evaluate sometimes. But she said this, and I want you to, I want you, and I think it's incredibly accurate of what she says. She says this. She says, Adventists seem to be very aware of their distinctive doctrines, but appear to have a low level of confidence in their relationship to God. Adventists spend time in Bible study each day, at least some of them do. But very few of them spend a significant amount of time talking to God in prayer. Adventists mistakenly attempt to substitute an intellectual grasp of their distinctive truths for the assurance of salvation, which every believer can enjoy in Christ. This substitution naturally, she says, results in spiritual insecurity and the dominance of guilt. Now, this lady is no prophet. This lady is no messenger of God, no more than you and I are. But this is a, a sincere observation of us as Adventists. And I can't help to agree 110% with her. Where she says, Adventists mistakenly attempt to substitute an intellectual grasp of their distinctive truths for the assurance of salvation. Man, that is right on the nail. You see, friends, I hope that we will eradicate from our people this insecurity, this dominance of guilt. Because we understand that our righteousness comes only from Jesus. That you and I develop a real, tangible walk with Jesus. I've met so many people get on my case. Pastor, you need to preach more about last day events. Pastor, you need to preach more about the, the Revelation 13 and the, the signs of the times. And I'm all about that. I'm not knocking. I'm not knocking prophecy. But the reality is... 
If we don't know how to love God now, what makes you think that you're going to be ready to love God in a time of trouble? If you don't develop that relationship now in a biblical way, how on earth are you going to develop that relationship when the trials of the end are coming? It's impossible. And so this is why Jesus began his new church on the Sermon on the Mount, his new following with these teachings, because he wants us to have a firm foundation. Once we build upon this, then the sanctuary makes perfect sense. Then the Sabbath makes perfect sense. Then the investigative judgment makes perfect sense. Then 1844, all of these incredible life-changing prophecies make sense when we understand that our relationship with God is solid and we cry out, Abba, Father. It is not until then that this is real. So my friends, my hope and prayer for you today is that you look at God with in this beautiful prayer and understand that we have to under number one, we need to know, we need to know that he loves us and that he only wants the best for us. Number two is that we have to have faith. And number three is that we have to have a real desire to worship and honor God with our lives and with whatever the answer to our prayer or the, the result of our searching or the door that opens is. That's what God wants for us. Friends, it's been a blessing to worship with you today. I hope that you were blessed. Today is May 9th. Uh, we're going to be uniting conference-wide, worldwide, uh, on a time of prayer and fasting. Today at 2 o'clock, the Zoom information will be, it was on the announcement slide, and it will be after I speak as well. Make sure you join us. Join us for that. It's going to be a powerful time for the whole Church of God here in Central California and abroad to get together and pray and uplift the, the, the name of Jesus together. May God bless you. May you have a beautiful Sabbath and may you have a wonderful Mother's Day weekend to all our beautiful ladies who are listening worldwide. We love you. May God bless you. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you so much that you have given us your love and your grace and this incredible promise that if we ask, that if we seek, if we knock, you will respond. And so, Father, I pray that today you bless us. I pray that today this reality becomes the thing that gives us peace in our anxiety, peace in our frustration, peace in our time of trouble. We love you, Father, and we thank you. And I ask your blessings upon everyone who is with us today. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. May God bless you, everyone. I love you with all my heart. I wish you all of God's blessings. And I hope you have a beautiful week. Again, happy Mother's Day to all of our beautiful ladies worldwide. I wish we would be able to celebrate with you. And I hope you have a beautiful time uh, this weekend with your family uh, who is at home. Or you're able to FaceTime and spend time with your loved ones, wherever they may be. We love you. Have a beautiful Sabbath. God bless you. Bye-bye.